Good morning. Welcome to The Well. Thank you so much for joining us in person as well as on our live stream. The Well is a church where wellness meets spirituality and community, and that word wellness points to our understanding that you're a holistic being made up of mind, body, and spirit, and that you want to be touched and transformed holistically in your mind, your body, your spirit. So it's our conviction that that happens on the spiritual path of Jesus. And so if you're here today and you're spiritually open, um, spiritual but not religious, or like me, spiritual and religious, our hope is that as we explore his path today, something on it would encourage you so that you could leave it, lead with, with greater, greater hope. Welcome to Sundays at the Well. Please stand. Well, again, welcome. We're glad you've joined us this morning. And we're going to start by worshiping through music. And as Aaron is talking about wellness and our conviction that we are humans that are mind, body, spirit, all at the same time, um, worshiping through music actually helps us connect all of those things together. Um, it gives you a chance, if you're someone who tends to primarily live in your head, to, to let the ideas and beliefs sink down and be lived out through your body. Um, and on the other side, if you're someone who tends to move through the world primarily in a bodily way, it gives you an opportunity to connect that bodily experience with your faith, um, with thoughts and ideas. Um, so I encourage you in that this morning to, to worship with your whole self um, as we sing together.
from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll
we thank you for inviting us in this morning. We thank you that you have torn the veil, that you have opened the gates to, to let us in. And you invited us into your presence. God, we thank you that there is joy in your presence as we thank you for who you are and the kind of love that you have for us, which is unconditional and eternal. So we thank you for um, that joy and for this morning and for the opportunity to be able to experience that in this community. What a special, what a special time that is. So we thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, Allison and team, for just uh, helping to open our hearts uh, to God's love for us. Kids, thank you for worshiping with us. You have a really awesome Art Sunday that you get to go to. So enjoy. Have so much fun. And uh, the rest of us, let's take a few minutes to say hi to those around you. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Thanks for joining us. If you've not met me yet, my name's Aaron. I'm the pastor here. Um, we have uh, an app that you can download. It helps you stay up to date with what we're doing on Sundays as well as throughout the week. Um, you know, one helpful framework for your spiritual life is to consider the framework of call and response. Um, call, uh, what are you, what are, what are you uh, invited to open your heart and your mind to? And then response, what does it look like to work that out? And so you can, you can think of these um, highlights uh, as opportunities for response, where on Sundays, you're invited to open your heart and your mind. And then throughout the week, uh, you're given opportunities to, to work that out. And so um, we have uh, our, released our first meditation music album called Epiphany that we're very excited about. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's inspired by what we do on Sunday mornings, um, as well as our pop-up meditation studio. So it's on all streaming platforms. You can go to our app as well and uh, get a link to, that bounces you right to um, Spotify. We want you to use it. We want it to, to, to really actually bless you and to help, um, help your, your spiritual life, um, whether it's uh, picking up or continuing a meditation practice or introducing a sense of, uh, of stillness in your life as well. So uh, use it, we're, we're really excited about it. Um, another thing that we're really excited about is on Saturday, June 8th, is gonna be our annual wellness retreat. Um, it's gonna be on Roseville Island at the Cornell Tech uh, Center. It's a beautiful place, it's, it's all glass. It's essentially like 360 views of the city. And so that alone uh, feels like 
uh, like, like, a, like a retreat, just, just going over the tram, the Roosevelt Island tram once a year, and, uh, and seeing this beautiful water in the, in the green. Um, and so this year, you're going to be invited to expand your consciousness, uh, to connect within and with others, and to renew your mind and your body and your spirit. Uh, the, the keynote talk uh, I'll be giving is called The Psychedelic Paradox, Unearned Wisdom, and the Search for Meaning. And so we want to explore what that is to expand your consciousness, to open up your awareness of, of what is. Uh, we have so many great workshops um, that day to choose from. Let me just highlight a couple of them. Uh, Vesper Stamper, who is an award-winning illustrator and is also a professor at SVA. She's going to be leading um, uh, her workshop called Pen Your Own Fairy Tale. And you know, sometimes it's hard to envision uh, what good your life could be for tomorrow, especially if you're in a, in a, in a hard season. Yeah, fairy tales do something very interesting for us, and that they invite us to consider that there could be a beauty that could kiss our beastliness away. And it opens up imagination and, and creativity. Um, fairy tales, in a sense, have long held uh, a mirror to our inner lives that, that, in a very creative way, can help navigate um, our inner world as well as our, our outer world. And so this workshop will give you an opportunity uh, to creatively unlock and express uh, a fairy tale that's maybe right there within you. Um, no artistic ability is needed, which is good news for me, because <laughs> I, I can't draw to save my life. So, but if you can't either, you should especially come. This would be a really, really neat workshop with Vesper. Uh, another one to highlight, um, Paul Schistler is a stand-up comedian. He cut his teeth here in New York. He's doing his thing out in LA. Um, his workshop is going to be an, an interactive comedy show with a twist. And, um, What's going to happen is there's going to be a, a form where you, in a sense, put some information in anonymously, and he's going to work that into a, an interactive uh, comedy show. Almost think Mad Libs for comedy, something like that. So if you need a levity, little levity for your life in your life, and we all you know do, we all need a little laughter. This would be good for the soul, um, and you're going to want to sign up for this workshop as well. Um, lots of other workshops that um, we'll continue to um, highlight uh, on Sundays. Um, this retreat is for everyday New Yorkers, it's for stressed out New Yorkers, it's for busy New Yorkers. You know, one of the things we're committed to at The Well is uh, to make holistic wellness um, accessible uh, to New Yorkers. Uh, you know, one of the things that we often hear is that the re these retreats are either really expensive or, or you have to take an airplane to, to, to them. And none of that's true here. So we want to encourage you to invite friends. Some, one of the things I hear most frequently after these retreats is, wow, I should have invited a friend. So I want to help you, know, na you navigate that future regret to consider inviting some friends now. And we also had, last year, um, people who couldn't make it still invited their friends. Their friends came. They said, we're so glad that we came. So even if you can't make it, uh, my encouragement is to invite. Um, and this is a wonderful opportunity, especially if, you're, uh, if, you, if the well is your spiritual uh, community, to invite colleagues and friends and neighbors and family members, those who you care about, um, uh, to, to get a little glimpse um, of, your, of, your, of your spiritual life. Um, right now, early uh, bird discounts are available online. We've got some um, cards in the back uh, at the social and the coffee hour. So please use that. It's going to be just a great opportunity. We're, we're really looking forward to it. Lastly, we have a social today. It's every month. Uh, we spend some time together on the second floor. Um, lunch, food, drinks, snacks. Uh, it's a great time. Even if you can only stay there for 10, 15 minutes, my encouragement is to, is to invite you up there. Um, and if you can stay all the way till 2, great. A special note for the parents. Uh, parents not attending the social, you can pick up your kids at noon on the fourth floor like normal. If you are going to be at the social, um, kids will be brought down at noon to eat together. And then they're going to be brought back up to the playroom um, f until 2 p.m. And if you need to leave earlier, you can always check out your kids b before 2. But they, you got to check them out by 2 because that's when everything closes shop. So make sure you get them. Don't let them be a permanent fixture here in the fourth floor uh, Scandinavia House Play Center. Um, but, you know, so see that as really an opportunity, especially if, especially if you're a parent, uh, just to see this as an extended time of being a person before you morph back into a parent. So uh, just a quick note for that. That's it for announcements. Uh, James is going to come up and read scripture, and then I'll come back up to give us our sermon. Uh, today's scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. 
Keep me safe, my God, for you, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks, James. Um, today we are in the third Sunday of the season of Easter. Uh, Easter is a 50-day long season historically that celebrates um, the life of the resurrection of Jesus. And um, in this season at the well, we take a, take a moment to look at the Bible's song book, the book of Psalms, and to consider that um, what, what songs are your hearts singing? Our hearts are singing some songs. What, what are they? And what is it to, to learn to teach your heart a, to sing a new song of resurrection? And so today our passage that was read will have us consider that resurrection helps you sing a song of joy. Resurrection helps you sing a, a, a song of joy. Um, and, you know, when we think about this, life falls apart. That's just kind of what life does. You know, light, light, there's really some difficult moments, some difficult seasons. And our instinct in those seasons is to either run from the, the situation to, or to control different aspects or people in the situation. And there is something to be said about both of those options. You know, those can be very good and very important options. One underrated uh, response and angle into difficult seasons is to consider not um, how you can control the situation, but who are you in the situation? You know, running, there's some validity to that. You know, trying to change different the parts of the circumstance, validity to that. But there's another one, which is not so much what is it to control the situation, but what is, what is it to consider who you are? Who are you in the situation? And, and that's important because in difficult seasons of life and situations, you control very little details of that situation. You know, whether it's something at work, something at home, uh, a neighbor always you know, up late at night playing loud music, uh, even like on a geopolitical scale, like with things that are happening in the Middle East, there are things that make life scary or difficult, and you can control very little of it but you can decide who you are in it. And this is where, from a biblical narrative perspective, joy enters into the conversation. And so in our culture, which is a very immediate culture, this, this immediate gratification um, shapes our lives in every way possible, and it seeps even into the, the area of understanding and identifying joy. And this immediate gratification um, shapes what we understand joy to be and has turned um, our, our desire for joy into a pursuit of happiness. In a sense, we've swapped out joy for, ha for happy. Happy is not bad. Happy is good. And joy is good. And they overlap in, in ways, and yet they're different in ways. Um, ha happy is, is brought on. Um, one, one psychologist uses the phrase sparked by, which I, I kind of like that, that imagery. That happiness is sparked by a moment that gives you a sense of excitement or comfort or exhilaration. Sort of like when you walk into your hotel room and you realize, holy moly, there's way more food in here in the snack bar than I, than I thought there would be in the room. That's, like, that's a moment of happy. And interestingly, happy is connected to luck etymologically. Luck is when Turn, moments, you know, turn out into your favor. So happy is important because happy gives you a, a, you know, it textures life um, a bit. 
Now, um, what happy, though, is also is temporary. I mean, even, even that phrase, sparked by, helps us consider um, an image of, of a spark. What is a spark? A spark is here one moment, and it's, it's gone the very next moment, which is not a bad thing in and of itself. It just becomes an issue when um, your life turns into this pursuit of just finding moments to be sparked by something, and you call that joy. Now, that's not, it's not so much joy as it is a pursuit of happiness, but that's not joy. And as a result, if you're constantly going through life thinking joy is just moments being sparked by something that excites you, you're, you're going to possibly miss joy altogether in your life. Uh, why? Because joy is not an emotion. Though you can say, I feel joyful today, and that's true. But rather, more specifically, joy is a state of being. And so the, inherently, it's, it's long-lasting. Because joy isn't characterized by being a, sparked in a moment, but instead joy is characterized uh, by a deep, deep sense of, of contentment. And from a psychological perspective, joy is a core emotion of happy. So that means joy is bigger than happy. Joy is more expansive than happy. Joy can hold happy, and joy can hold other things, like difficult things, like sadness. Joy can hold happy and sadness together at the exact same time. And that begins to make sense of, of all the accusations against those who are walking Jesus' spiritual path. The most damning accusation was by Nietzsche when he said, Christians have no joy. Of all, of all the accusations out there, if you follow Jesus by faith, no matter strong or weak, your, your faith or your life looks the, the hardest the hardest one, the hardest one, is that Christians have no joy. And I wonder if that makes you curious, whether you're a Christian or, or whether you're spiritually open. It's very interesting. And um, it's a passage like Psalm 16 that can actually open that, open that up a bit for us. Um, it's quite a beautiful psalm, as it was read. Um, it can touch you in, in different places. Um, the the world-class Hebrew scholar Robert Alter notes that our psalm is essentially a confession of faith. And it ends with the, with the psalmist being in a, in a state of joy. But it starts with the psalmist's world upside down. And um, we see verse 1 opens up with the need for safety. The psalmist is, is crying out for refuge. You know, someone has, someone has hurt the psalmist. You know, someone has, 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 has uh, made the psalmist fearful, maybe threatened the psalmist. And this is important to note that, that this... That, uh, that a psalm about joy starts with this moment of pain, this, this need for help. That's, first of all, because it's real. That's just how life works. But it's also important because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's really easy to profess alignment um, when everything's going well. You know, it's easy to hold when the markets are up and to be confident in your positions. But man, when things turn upside down, that's a, that's a totally different story. And therefore, what this psalm shows us is that one of the gifts that difficult seasons give to you is that they reveal what's really within. They, they, they reveal what you, what you really believe. And so the psalmist in verse 1 essentially starts with help, and then in verse 2, he starts his confession of faith. And he does so by acknowledging the good in his life, which is very interesting. World's falling apart, gripped with fear, gripped with pain, Gripped with anxiety, uh, maybe logistics in his life is com are completely upside down, and yet he, he, he starts by acknowledging the good in his life. And think about that. You know, th that kind of level of awareness, that level of consciousness is, for him, is so expansive that even when the world falls apart and falling on him, he has uh, the awareness for gratitude. And, you know, if, you he, if, you are, if you're reading this, if you hear this, and you say, well, that's not my response when the world falls apart, is gratitude, um, that's okay. Um, and if you're noticing that within you, that's not my response, and then you notice other emotional responses like guilt or, or upsetness or, or envy, that's okay too. Those feelings can, can show you that you're stuck feeling like maybe you're a victim in life, that life is happening to you, or you're stuck in sort of a self-centeredness, 
in which life is for you or, or about you, but neither of those postures in life actually give you space for gratitude, it's especially when, when, when things fall apart. And what, what's helpful to see is that the core emotion of gratitude is love. And so if it's true that difficult seasons expose and reveal what's really in you, and in the psalmist's difficult season, what's exposed, what's revealed is gratitude, then it tells us that the psalmist has taken um, time to cultivate a deep sense of love within. And so if, you know, just being a, kind of an honest, not a guilt and shaming kind of way, but just more of an observational kind of way, if, you, if you're hearing this and you're looking at the psalmist and you go, gosh, my response when life falls apart is not gratitude, that's okay. We can keep moving in the psalm because he gives us a framework um, to, to consider what is it to cultivate a deep sense of God's love within so that when you're really squeezed, um, love comes out. Um, gratitude becomes an authentic response. It sounds like a beautiful way uh, to live and to be, and it's, and it's possible. And so the psalmist gives you a framework of, of how, to, how to do that. Um, so verse 7, he gives us a spiritual practice. We could say praising God. And then verse 8, another spiritual practice, keeping your eyes on God is what the psalmist says. So let's look at those. Uh, so first, verse 7, I will praise God. Um, sounds so generic, I'll praise God. Verse, verse 9 opens that up a little bit more when he says his tongue rejoices. Now we need to make sure we're not making this what it's not. And what this is not, a very guilt, shame, driven, religious response when life falls apart is to say, see, look, in all places, in all times, praise God. Uh, that's, that, that's such a narrow merit-based approach to your spiritual life when life falls apart. Oh, pra praise God, all times, all places. Um, that, that's a silly application because that's just, that's just not how life works, and that's not how the psalmist's lives work. When you look at the psalmist, there are other places where the psalmist will accuse God, you know, and say, why have you forsaken me? You have forsaken me, God. And there are other places in the, in the psalms where the psalmist will say, you know, we'll kind of yell at God, you know, God, you're hidden, rise up. And we see that the, the spiritual life of the psalmist has room to accuse God, to, to, to be mad at God. And then he's got enough nerve to say, oh, I, will, I praise God, my tongue rejoices. I praise God. What's, what's going on there? It doesn't make any sense. How can you say you praise God? You, you accuse God, you're upset at God, you're angry at God, you blame God. And, and the clue there, if we open up more in this passage, verse 7 um, in the Hebrew, uh, is literally that he praises Yahweh. That's in the Hebrew, which is, which is the specific Hebrew name for the God of the Bible, Yahweh. And that's important because verse 4 actually opens that up for us in our passage. Um, keep in mind that the psalmist lives in a polytheistic uh, landscape. And verse 4, he says, Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Okay, so he's saying, there are lots of gods out there. I'm not going to do those gods, but I will do Yahweh. I'll do the, I'll do the God written um, in the Bible. I'll put this God on my lips. So we, we start to see kind of a mouth, like a tongue, lips, are going to be reserved for the God of the Bible. That's what he's saying. My, my mouth will be reserved for the God of the Bible and for no other gods out there and for no other spirits, but for the, but for the God written in the Bible which gives us a far more nuanced view of what it means to have God on your lips. It means blaming God, accusing God, yelling at God, making accusations against God, and exalting God are all examples of God on your lips. It's easy to think that the opposite of I will praise God is I will not be mad at God, I will not blame God, I will not accuse God. But Psalm 16, taken as a whole, gives us a far more nuanced understanding of what is it to, to reserve your mouth, your lips, for the God of the Bible. And it's, to, it is not blaming God. The opposite of not having God on your lips is to turn to other gods, to, to over-ruminate, to obsess over other gods when life falls apart. And we have a tendency to do that, such as maybe when life falls apart, like we, we obsess about control or power or status or approval of others. We think about that constantly. We, we even lose sleep over it. We've turned our hearts, we've turned our mouths to other gods. 
And in fact, when you lose sleep, that's a, that can be an indicator, not a proof, but an indicator that maybe the God of the Bible is not on your lips. And just, you know, not a, not a guilt kind of way, but more just an observational kind of way. And so this psalm is inviting you to ask, does your spiritual life have room for not only how dare you, God, but how great are you, O God? Because both of those are God on your lips. And, you know, some seasons you, you can say both. Other seasons you can only say how dare you, God. But take heart. Uh, both are God on your lips. So we see the spiritual practice of the psalmist is that he, he refuses to over-ruminate and obsess over other gods, but rather he puts the God, the Bible, on his lips. But secondly, what we see in verse 8 is that he has his eyes on God. Okay, other translations for verse 8 are, I have set God continually before me. It's kind of an interesting way to say it. Or, I know God is always with me. In other words, he's, he's aware of God's presence in his life. Okay, so this is the well, class. What is the spiritual practice that helps you become aware of God's presence in your life? And the answer is meditation. That's the spiritual practice, is, is meditation. And what we see in the biblical narrative is that the God of the Bible breathed into man, and out, of, and out of man came breath and life. That shows us, then, that um, your breath is connected to God, which means every time you are aware of your breath, you have the opportunity to be aware of God, which means every time you feel like saying, and you should say it if you feel like saying it, God, where are you? How could you? A really good response is then to breathe. Is in, is, in to, is in to breathe. And, you know, that's why we have our, our meditation studio on Mondays. This is why we have our, our, our meditations on our app to use every day. Uh, it's why we released this Epiphany album. This is why in our children's ministry we teach the kids at a very, very young age the spiritual practice of, of silence um, and meditation to help them um, learn from a very young age. That no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are, you always have your breath. And it reminds you that you always have God. God has literally put a spiritual resource within you um, every single time you breathe. And the language that scholars use to describe what is hap why does meditation work? Like, what is happening spiritually when, when, you, when you meditate? Um, the language that, that, that scholars use is the, is the, uh, the language spiritual excavation. Spirit, spiritual excavation. And um, on the surface level of your consciousness, there, there's a lot of chatter, especially in, in difficult seasons. Conversations, memories that just play over and over and over in your mind, the what ifs over and over in your mind. And, and your anxiety is rooted right there to that chatter. And when you follow your breath and you begin to gently put aside the chatter, you begin to spiritually excavate. You begin to go down within you. And you start by going underneath your, your chatter, and, you go, and you just, you'll discover you bump into your anger. And if you keep spiritually excavating, follow your breath, you go underneath your breath, and you bump into your fear. And if you keep spiritually excavating some more, you go underneath your fear, and you bump into your pain. This is how the ancients have described what's happening in your meditation. And at that spot, when you get to your pain, you realize that all your fears, all your anger, all your anxieties are all sitting on your pain. They all come from your pain. It's from your pain that you hurt people and hurt others. And what the ancients show, remind us is that the goal, spiritually, is to get underneath your pain. And as you get underneath your pain through your spiritual excavation, you discover there's this vast space within yourself that the Bible calls the very ground of your being. It's a, it's a place that, that only God can touch. Because the, the scriptures tell us that it's in God that you live and move and have your being. And so theologians call this um, your hidden self. You get this from Ephesians 3, the New Testament. Your, your hidden self, that's a language that Christian spirituality uses. And, and when you access this, this vast space within yourself, you have, you have um, joy becomes accessible. Because joy is expansive. Joy is spacious. 
And you relate to yourself and to God with joy when, when you sit in that space. That's why so often we, we hear the words fullness or filled. They're associated with joy. I mean, even in our scripture, verse 11 says, You, O God, fill me with joy. Joy is expansive. And so to use proximate language, you relate to joy best when you discover God's presence in the very ground of your being than in the very narrow level of your anxious chatter. Hard to experience joy there when your thoughts are riveted to your anxieties. It's almost impossible to then have uh, um, an awareness of God's presence in your life. Very hard to, to, to root to joy um, on the level of, of, of your chatter. And that means if joy is in a space that only God can touch, it means that you can experience joy even in difficult times. Uh, we see this with um, verse 11 again. Oh, God, you fill me with joy in your presence. You fill me. God fills you. God gives you joy. It's, it's not something that's earned. It's not something that you seek and find like, like happiness to be sparked by it, but rather it's a, it's a natural result or consequence of sitting with God in that deep space within yourself, in that hidden part of yourself. And that's where we discover that Joy, you don't pursue it, but rather joy ensues within you. Joy isn't pursued, but joy ensues within you, which means joy has room for sorrow because it ensues when you are right where you need to be, which is to be aware of God's presence in your life, even if where you need to be is difficult. It's at that moment that joy in, ensues in your life. And then it's through joy that God can look at the, you in these difficult seasons, you know, pick up your broken pieces and, and say to them, this, this isn't going to last forever. That's what God says to your broken pieces in, in, in joy. That sounds very certain. What do you mean it's not going to last forever? Well, we, we see a certainty um, with the psalmist in our passage. Um, verse 10 the psalmist says, God, you will not abandon me to death. Seems very certain, because death is so certain. But as, as a Christian spiritual community, when you read that, hear that phrase, you hear it through the lens of, of Easter. It is Eastertide. It's the season of Easter. And what do we think of? We think of resurrection. And with this certainty, verse 10 continues and says, God, you will not let your faithful one see decay. Faithful one. Well, I'm not, it's, not, it's not me. It's not you. Again, through the lens of Easter, it's, it's Jesus. He's the faithful one. He was the one who was abandoned to the realm of the dead, but not to decay, but to work death backwards. So that one day, everything sad can come untrue. And that's the pattern of the cross and resurrection. Cross, sorrow, resurrection, joy. And they come together in Jesus. And if Jesus is in you, it means... It comes together in you. And, and that's why um, that the, the criticism of Christians lack joy, which can be so accurate, you know, is the most damning if you're following Jesus by faith because you've actually been given the power for joy. Again, not anything that you've sought out, not anything that you've earned, but simply something that you've been given. Now, all you need to do is, is rest, is surrender, to this power of cross-resurrection, and joy ensues within you. And as joy ensues, it doesn't mean that um, sorrow becomes less sad or difficult. It doesn't mean difficult seasons become easy. You know, but it does mean that God, through joy, uh, changes who you are in those seasons. And then you discover that joy was given to those who walk uh, Jesus' spiritual path by faith, to be a visible, a visible sign, in a sense, an, an, an outward expression of the joy that's given to the world for the life of the world. So as we think about this psalm, as we think about joy, that's, it, the question is, you know, does, your, does, your, does your spiritual life have enough room for happy and sad, for joy and sorrow at the same time? That ensues in you, and, and then through that, God <laughs> deepens uh, a sense of, of, of his love within you. 
And that really is, is Easter joy. So with that, I'd like to invite you to a time of guided meditation. James, you can come on up. This is something that we do each Sunday after the sermon. It's a chance to hold space for ourselves and to consider all that God might be saying to you or anything that might be resonating within you. And so I invite you to go ahead and close your eyes um, in person as well as on our live stream. And we close our eyes because in doing so, it um, blocks out the outside world and it allows your um, spiritual imagination to take on just a different uh, texture. And so with your eyes closed, um, I just invite you to start by simply counting your breath. Uh, breath counts are something that uh, are used in pretty much um, every spiritual path, and we see it in Christian spirituality from the very beginning. It reminds us of the fact of our breath. It brings us to the awareness of our breath. It reminds us that we can be so unaware of activity that's literally happening underneath our noses. And so every time you inhale and exhale, I just invite you to begin to just gently begin to count to yourself. Inhale, exhale, two, you say to yourself. Inhale, exhale, three, and so on. And just very gently follow your breath and every inhale and exhale, just continue to count. with your eyes remaining closed, I invite you to use a sacred word. A sacred word represents your intention to be still and to surrender to a joy that can ensue within. And I invite you to use the word joy as your sacred word. Which means as you count your breath, every time you find your mind wandering, simply drop the thought, say your sacred word to yourself, joy, and then come back to the present moment, counting your inhale and your exhale. Do that with each cycle of breath.
I invite you to continue to spiritually excavate by following your breath. And every time you find your mind wandering, simply drop the thought, say your sacred word to yourself, joy, and then come back to the present moment of your breath and continue to count and do that with each cycle of breath. your eyes remaining closed, I invite you to shift your posture to one of recentering. When we recenter, we are always reminded that our lives are always centered on something. And that's what makes us human. Except you get to choose what your life is centered on. And whatever your life is centered on, that's what drives your life. That's where you get meaning and purpose. That's where your joy is. So as you hear these words, grab onto a word or a phrase or an entire idea and open up your heart to God to a posture of surrender. Hear these words as words of hope and comfort and truth for you today. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through God's spirit in your hidden inner self so that Jesus may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus for you. And therefore, let your gentleness be evident to all. And in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which trans all, transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus. And so grab onto a word or a phrase or an entire idea and open up your heart to God through a posture of surrender.
Oh God, we thank you for this moment in which we are invited to spiritually excavate within ourselves. And we thank you that as we do that, we discover that there is something uh, deeper than our anxieties or our anger or our fears or our pain. We thank you that at the very foundation of who we are, uh, we discover you. It's a place that only you can touch. And so I pray for each person here. Everybody's fighting their own battle. Might they remember that through their breath, you are always with them and that you never leave them and that your presence in their life is the most sure thing and that they can sit with that with such confidence because of Jesus who the faithful one for us uh, defeated brokenness, defeated sin, defeated death so that we could rest in him with life. Might we experience that in the very depths of our being this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we move to um, the time of the offertory, historically, the offertory and communion uh, are connected together. Uh, and it starts with the words, the gifts of God for the people of God. And it reminds us that God has not just given us um, spiritual blessings, but tangible blessings as well. And so I invite you uh, one more time to close your eyes and with your eyes closed to um, grab on with your spiritual imagination something very tangible that you have, uh, your income, your apartment, a vacation you took, your clothes, a great meal that you had. And instead of saying, it's not enough, I need more, which is so often where our hearts sit, I invite you to say to God, oh, no, everything I have is enough. Thank you, God. And just to um, really feel a sense of gratitude overflowing within you. Um, go ahead and do that now. Oh God, we thank you for this moment of gratitude. It, it, it expands our consciousness like the psalmist. That no matter what we're going through, we can, there's always room in our spiritual life to pause and say, thank you for the good that I have. It comes from you. And that, that does make us p deeper people of hope and it allows joy to ensue in our lives. So I thank you for all the good that you've given each and every one of us. Uh, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as we shift our posture to the time of communion, historically the communion is, is seen as the highest moment in this, the worship service in which everything, the, the music, the silence, the prayers, the sermons, scriptures pointing to this moment because it's here that you're spiritually nourished and fed by Jesus. You experience his spiritual presence. And that's why we say that this, is, this table is for all those who put their hope and their faith and trust in Jesus and call him Lord. This describes you and you're baptized uh, from a community that follows Jesus by faith. Um, then this table is for you. And I like to remind people, um, come, especially if uh, this is a hard season, a dark season, you feel very weak, because this table is not for the strong. Uh, come if you feel like your heart is filled with doubts and questions. Jesus taught mainly through questions. God loves your questions. Uh, this table is not for the know-it-all. It's for those who know they need the one, in a sense, who, who does know it all, who knows that, that there is a plan for your life and that God loves to provide for you. Um, if that doesn't describe you and you're wrestling with Jesus from afar, um, that's amazing. You're, I'm so glad you're worshiping with us. You are right where you need to be. Uh, and my encouragement is to let the elements pass and instead consider following Jesus today by faith. It would be a great day to do so. But, and so if you're following him, no matter how weak or strong this season uh, feels like for you, um, come to this table. We have communion stations in the front and the back. Um, take your, the whole plate back to your seat and we'll partake together. So with that, let me... Let me pray for us. Um, oh God, we thank you for this moment of spiritual nourishment, spiritual presence. We thank you that you're, that you're with us. We ask that by the power of your spirit, you would set aside these ordinary elements of the cup and the, the bread and the cup for our spiritual use. 
And then would you send us out into this world as people of deeper joy and deeper hope because this joy is ensued in us. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and having given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And at the same time, he took the cup, having given thanks. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And we're reminded that as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we'll let about a minute of music go by if you want to come forward for communion now. body of Christ, take and eat. And the blood of Christ, take and drink. Please join me in a moment of reflection as we pray. presence, nourishment. It reminds us that we're not alone, that you're always with us and you love to provide for us. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our last song. So 
joy and peace that you offer is deeper than any circumstance that we face. We thank you that it is accessible beneath any kind of turmoil. The turmoil from our inner chatter, from anger or heartbreak, or by things going on in our families and communities and turmoil in our world. We lift these things to you in prayer. and We take a moment this morning to lift up the, the conflict in the Middle East to you and, and say, may your will be done, God. Would you show us how to pray? Our hearts break at new threats of war and violence. And God, we ask for your protection over the weak and the vulnerable. Would you give wisdom to leaders and may they heed your words. And God, the good news is that we can set these requests down at your feet and rest in you. We know from experience that holding on to fear and worry just makes us seasick. So we present our requests and our circumstances, even if there isn't necessarily a specific request, we we put them at your feet. We know that you are good. And so we have hope. We have hope not only for this life, but 
We also have hope in the promise of eternal life with you, a new heaven, a new earth. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who confirms all this in us, who tells us that we are yours. And we thank you for this song that we just sang, this refrain that has helped many generations of Christians to embody all this and to live it out. Oh God, would you deepen our faith? Would you deepen our joy? We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. If you want prayer, you want to process anything you heard, um, Gail, our prayer team leader, will be in front of the stage. She'd love to pray and talk with you. Uh, we also have our social on the second floor. Um, as a reminder, parents, if you're going to be staying for that, the kids will be brought down for lunch and brought back up, and they just have to be um, picked up by 2 p.m. Uh, on the fourth floor. Um, if you aren't able to stay for the social and you have kids, you can pick them up at noon. So you still have um, over 15 minutes to be a person with us on the second floor before you morph back into a parent. So just enjoy that, that social. Um, if you're new to the well, you've just begun to interact with us, my encouragement is to invite you to walk with us through this season of Easter. Uh, and see if what we're doing here um, helps you. And then through the experience of God gives you a deeper sense of, of hope and joy. Many of you have taken me up on that. It's just been an honor and a, and a joy to walk with you in that way. But now, as you go throughout the rest of your day and the rest of your week, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in God so that you might overflow with hope as you see joy ensue from within by the power of God's Spirit. Have a great morning. Go in peace.